This episode is called Rumpole and the Sporting Life. Barristers used to have days out with a, a race which barristers would ride or the ho- they would own the horses that ride. And uh, Hilda takes Rumpole out. Rumpole doesn't really enjoy country life, but there's a scene in this episode in a car where he's sitting and a very large dog sitting behind him keeps on licking his face. And in order to play this scene, the wonderful Leo McKern allowed us to put butter behind his ears so that the dog would uh, be licking him. The case which arises out of this uh, day in the country is that uh, one of the, the wife of one of the winning jockeys, who is also a horse owner and an upper-class person, confesses to having shot him and is tried for murder. And by perhaps a fortunate chance, the judge, Rumpo discovers, is someone who hanged a person convicted of murder who was afterwards found to be innocent. And he has an uneasy conscience about this and uh, does his very best for the defence. Congratulations. What do you have on it? A quid each way? I'll be able to retire to Bermuda. First, number 13, Atlantic Hero, ridden by the Honourable Jonathan Poston. Second, number 8, Cash Point. And third, number 4. I'm so sorry that Phil wasn't able to be with us today. Yeah, Philly's got this long fraud up in Leeds. Yes. She's working all the weekend. She would so much have enjoyed it. Of course, Rampo has really no sporting interest. I've often wondered why sporting interests have to be held in leaking wellies and cold mud. What do you fancy for the three o'clock, Henry? Well, his clerk tells me that Mr Lorimer's not all that fit. He's been overworking on his revenue cases. Likely to fall at the first fence, is he? Hmm. Harley Waters, QC. In good condition, is he? Been taking his oats and all that? Yeah, rather too liberally, according to his clerk. Now, the fancy is Mr E. Smith on decree absolute. Oh, uh, in good form, is he? Teetotal, his clerk informs me. And he does press ups in chambers. Simply, Uncle Tom, I won. Oh, really, Mrs. Rumpel? I didn't know you were running. <laughs> Will the course doctor please come to the declarations office? The course doctor, please. I'm so glad. <laughs> this one is on me, you know. Oh, Hilda's in the chair. Question Brown. Dot. Oh, there you are, Rumpel. I haven't had you before me lately. I suppose you don't get any of the serious crimes these days. Oh, I've been occupied elsewhere. I must join my wife. She's spending the winnings. I've been having a little flutter here, have you? I don't see you as a gambling man, exactly. I suppose a lifetime spent in Old Bailey trials gives one a taste for games of chance. What's that supposed to mean? Well, don't you sometimes feel that trying to assess the outcome of a case is rather like sticking a pin in the sporting light with your eyes shut? The aim of an English criminal trial is to do justice. I don't see you can possibly compare it to a horse race. 
Good day, Askin Brown. Good day to you, sir. Propos. Clyburn's our oldest judge. Yes, I know, I know. They appointed so long ago they can't get rid of him. He's one of the last survivors that ever sentenced people to death. They say he used to order muffins at his club on those occasions. <laughs> Come on, sweetheart, fill this cherry up with shampoo. Oh, look, we got Johnny, I'm excessively thrilled. One small rum, Hilda, is that the extent of our celebration? I thought you were going to fill my wellies with shampoo. Well, cheers. You're very good, Hilda. Thank you, Rumpel. Oh, Mrs. Rumpel, how are you, Erskine Brown? Oh, all right, I suppose, Hilda. You're in uniform, too. All these khaki-clad figures slogging through the mud. It reminds me of the retreat from Mons. <laughs> <laughs> you were never at Mons. Rob Hole was in the RAF ground staff, but you're All right, put me in mind of the natty, the RAF Uxbridge after every night. <laughs> well, this is for another fifth race. Hello, 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 this is my big sister, Jennifer Poston. This is Rumpo, Mrs. Rumpo. Oh, how riveting. I've heard so much about you. Pimsy says you got her into chambers by some miracle. <laughs> it was one of my trickier cases, yes. Pimsy says you win them all because you're the most super barrister in the whole of England. Absolutely brilliant, says Pimsy. Daddy always came to the bar races, but it took me weeks to persuade Rumpo to accept Claude Erskine Brown's wonderful invitation. <laughs> Did you come on your own, Tiana? No, with my boyfriend, Jeremy Jarley. He's rather dull, but he is a solicitor. He's the one doing the serious drinking. <laughs> oh, look. There's my gorgeous winner. I say, your wife, is she really the one you call? She no, was... she's the one I call Hilda. Rumpo, that's the chap who won for me on Atlantic Piano. Oh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> Well Kiss for the winner, Johnny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Such a nice looking young man. Do you know him? He's my husband. Oh, really? I do think I ought to thank him personally. Well, come on, then. Why don't we whiz over? Oh. Oh, I, I say, I must just say, well done. It does make a day at the races so much more thrilling when you're on a winner. Well, you can't say I saw you. <laughs> oh, these amazing old reekies. This is Mr. and Mrs. Rumpole, Johnny. And Claude Erskine Brown. Mr. Rumpo's a tremendous legal eagle. Oh, my God, you're not one of the galloping barristers. Oh, hardly. None of your lot got placed. Terribly bad luck. Go for a swig. Thank you. <laughs> well Thank you very much. Fish face. He's cutting us dead. Come on, fish, don't be weedy. Good afternoon, Mr. Fish. This is Maurice Fishbourne, lives next door to Jennifer and Jono. Oh. Delighted to meet you. I say, Fish, how did you manage to stick on to the last fence? Super glue. <laughs> <laughs> he was not hanging on to the main, I saw him. Oh, congratulations, Jonathan. <laughs> oh, isn't he a lovely loser? I say, Fish, if you want to ride something in the next place, why not try a bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> I am not riding in the next race. Oh, is Mummy taking you home to tea? I'm driving mother home, yes, Jennifer. Oh, come on, Fishy. Have a gulp of shampoos. It's quite all right. Only got all our germs in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Lodge for sale on Gentleman's Estate in Wooded Country, near Chester. Mm. What's that you're reading, Hilda? Country life, of course. Were there no daily telegraphs? Three bedrooms, two recepts, with access to good rough shooting. Oh, I rather think... Doesn't it sound attractive, Rumpo? I rather think I've got worries enough without you taking up rough shooting. What did you say? I said it might be safer in Tooting or around the inner London sessions. I mean, in those places, one can go for a walk without running the risk of getting a charge of grape shot or whatever it is in your britches. Nonsense, Rumpo. That day at the bar races made me realize what we're missing. Mud? The countryside. Oh. Now, then, if we sold our lease here... Oh, yes, we could... we could buy a deer park in a Palladian mansion. Daddy always used to say that what a successful barrister really needed was a place in the country. 
Was he speaking from the stately semi-detached to 13 Acacia Avenue, Horsham at the time? Can't you just see us from here? Sitting by a log fire, taking a glass of sherry, perhaps, while the sun sinks over the home wood. Hilda, I can see us with the boiler gone out and all the London trains cancelled, up to our elbows in snow and mud. And out in the home wood, somebody's bound to be killing something. I shot him. It was an accident. No, I really would rather not, Fiona, but I'll put your sister onto a good man. Rumpel Sprod wants you to defend her. Well, that's probably because you've given your sister a quite exaggerated idea of my abilities. Is it really possible to exaggerate your abilities? No, probably not. Well, why shouldn't my sister have the best possible counsel available? No, oh, friends, Fiona. What? It's a rule at the bar, never appear for friends. You care too much, your judgment gets warped, you can't see the weaknesses in your own case. And, of course, if you lose, they never, ever forgive you. But my sister's not your friend, you only met her the once. Quite honestly, you hardly know her. I know you, though. All the trouble I had getting you into these chambers, by some pretty ruthless manoeuvring, if you want to know the truth. And then I have to spend the rest of my life avoiding your eye in the clerk's room. Too afraid to pop into Pomeroy's for a strengthener in case you're there, looking at me more in sorrow than in anger, because I lost your sister's case. No, thank you. Life would be quite intolerable. I do understand that, but... But me no buts, Fiona. I was only going to say, but... You aren't going to lose it, are you? Oh. <sighs> Rumble. Uh, yeah. Just a minute. Ah, why don't you bring your stuff in here, eh? Ah, thank you. Nice to meet you. Darling, Jeremy, darling. Yes, how do you do? Stuck in the Boston case. Yes. There you go. Now, please hop in. Uh, no. Oh, don't mind Agatha. She's a soppy old date, really. <laughs> There's a young girl. Now then, where would you like to go? Ah. Test their arms or the prison? Well, uh, which is the least uncomfortable? I would say the prison, Pinch. Oh? Run you there, shall I? It's a little way out of town. Thank you. Built up. Pardon? Uh, oh. Yes. Well, I must say, this is all the GMBU. GMBU? Grand military balls up. Well, you ah. since we had a murder in the test of a hunt, you know. Yeah. Well, Agatha, do sit down. Stop kissing Mr. Rumpel. Oh, she's fine. Yeah. Well, it'll get all those damn blood sports protesters going, you know. Yeah. You're a partner, are you? Yeah, darling, Agatha, leave Mr. Rumpel alone with her. No, 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 no she's fine, she's fine. Is it, um, Charlie and Leonard, actually? Yes. It's my father's firm, I gotta say. But he uh, doesn't like murder cases, so he's handed this one on to me. Do, Agatha, will you sit down? Stop kissing Mr. Rumpel. Oh, she's fine. <laughs> uh, well, you know what they say. You have to start at the bottom. Oh. <laughs> did you uh, did you know Jonathan Poston well? No, only very briefly, I'm afraid. Uh, you know, people around here had a tremendous lot of time for him. Oh, really? I'm sorry. Huh? Well, it's the last thing the defence needs in a murder case, a well-liked corpse. Oh. Well, of course, you'd uh, 
you'd know all about that, wouldn't you? There's only one trouble with John O'Poston. Bad case of the MTFs. The, uh... MTFs. Must touch flesh. Ah. Particularly the flesh of Debbie Pavia. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear, dear, dear. <laughs> uh, well, that was what all the row was about, wasn't it? Was it? No, if it hadn't been for that, the local gendarmes might have accepted Sprague's story about an accident. No questions asked. Really? In London, we hardly ever see death. Once or twice in a lifetime. An old age pensioner, perhaps, collapsed on a cold night in the queue, or a shape under a blanket in a small crowd as we drive past an accident. In this peaceful landscape, they see it every day. They watch hounds tearing foxes to pieces or coarse hares. They hang up magpies and jays in the wood as a warning to others. I'll lay a small wager that at the end of that garden, there's some retired naval man tearfully putting down his dog. No doubt about it, death's a routine event in the country. Well, what's a husband more or less in the shooting season? And that would be the, the basis for the defense. It was an accident. Yeah. Your housekeeper, Mrs. Um, Mrs. Hemp. Mrs. Hemp, yes. She said you were quarreling that afternoon. A bit of a hangover after a serious evening. Do you remember saying something about killing? Isn't it the sort of thing one says? Oh, is it? Well, don't you quarrel sometimes? With she who must uh, Happily, aid. neither of us have a shotgun. After the quarrel, your husband went out. He wanted a walk, I suppose, to cool off. And so did you. Yes. But you took your 20 ball with you. You know something about guns. Why did you do that? I thought it might calm my nerves if I shot something. Not the most tactful way of explaining your feelings to a jury. Uh, no, I think we might... I meant uh... rough shooting, a pigeon perhaps, or a rabbit or something of that sort. Mm. Was your gun loaded when you met your husband? Of course. I put up a pheasant. I was about to have a shot when I remembered it was... After February, closed season for pheasants. But not for husbands. I must have forgotten to put the safety catch on. I walked on a little. Yes, go on. I told Jeremy. Tell me. I saw Jono coming towards me. Was he still angry? No, no, I don't think so. He, he seemed perfectly calm, actually. And what about you? Oh, I was calm enough. I walked towards him. It was rough, you know, brambles. It needed clearing. I must have tripped. Well, that's how it happened. I don't suppose you happen to have a small cigar about you? No, I... Hmm? Ah, I've left it in your car. Oh, Lord, I suppose Agatha is guarding them with her fangs bared. Oh, I'll always out and get them. Oh, thank you. Okay. Back in it, Jeff. He's one of your lot, isn't he? Jeremy, we hmm. know his father, of course. Of course. I am not one of your lot, Mrs. Boston. Unlike Jeremy, I don't drive round the country with a weapon and a hound of the Baskervilles in the back of my car. I'm not even familiar with your language, which seems to me to have been designed with the express purpose of saying absolutely nothing. I have descended among you like a creature from outer space. You may talk to me as to a complete stranger. What do you want me to say? Anything you think I should know. I told you it was an accident. So, I walk. I stumble. Bang. It's possible, I suppose. But it's much more likely I would have blown your feet off. Never, never let your gun pointed be at anyone. There's that nothing. it should unloaded be matters not the least to me. Come again. You don't know that? No, we must have learned different nursery rhymes. Well, Jennifer Poston would have known it, though, wouldn't she? She learned her gun training, I should think, at the nanny's knee. Oh, rather, yes. Her father was a terrific shot, you know. Oh? Yeah, it runs in the family. What are you looking at? Oh, the scene of the crime, the locus in quo. What do you do now? Crawl round on your hands and knees collecting old bits of cigarette ash in an envelope? <laughs> Not exactly. This locus in quo looks exactly like any other bit of the English countryside to me. 
Where does this lead to? More Poston country? No, uh, Fishbourne country, actually. Who? Morris Fishbourne. Dreadful weed, with a good deal of money. He gets ragged a lot for trying to ride at point to point. Invariably hits the deck. Fish face. Oh, of course, you met him. Yeah, friend of the Parsons. What? <laughs> they can't stand him. Really? Well, no one can, actually. <laughs> He's not exactly PLU. People like us. <laughs> well, he puts up all those positive notice boards all over his land. Gets his cash from laxatives. Oh. Fish bones keep you regular. I rely on the old medicinal claret. <laughs> ah. Hello, someone in pain? Oh, no, not at all. That is a cry of pure randomness. <laughs> Look, I'll show you. It's a calling bird, a caged cock pheasant. A calling pheasant in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. Yes, well, anyway, the old devil that lives here keeps it to entice all the post and lady pheasants into the garden, you see? Of course, when they get there, he just knocks them off from the front window. Cunning, isn't it? The wanton boy that kills the flies shall earn the spider's enmity. Didn't Jonathan Poston know he was being robbed? Well, yes, I suppose he, he just let it go on. Huh? Old Johnny was a bit of an innocent in spite of everything. Mm. Anyhow, he couldn't have got Figgis out of the cottage. He's a protected tenant. Did you say Figgis? Hmm. I bet he's in there. Do you want to talk to him? Uh, talk to a prosecution witness? Oh, dear me, no, no, no. Oh. Definitely NSOB. NSOB? Not sporting old bean. Pathology department. Yes, Professor Ackerman, please. Thank you. Hello, old sweetheart. I hope to catch you before you vanish into the morgue. Oh, how'd you know it was me? <laughs> Fine, thank you. Ah, yes, I'm afraid I could do with some help. No, it's not blood this time. It's gunshot wounds. No, not a handgun, a shotgun. Yes, excuse me. Oh, all these things back there. You can't run up and shot and say, what, a 20-day shotgun cartridge. I see. Come in. Oh, yes, indeed, yes. No, I know the book very well, but I don't see how I can lay hands on a copy of it down here now. Well, that would be splendid if you'd post me one. Thank you. I have to cross-examine the local pathologist. Yes. Well, thank you again. Happy dissecting. Yes, bye. Morning. Uh, you got the car outside? Mm. Is Agatha in it? Oh, rather. I think I'll walk. Ah, so you've been working on it? Most of the night. I suppose you've seen that. Oh. Dr. Overton's post-mortem report in considerable detail. Yes, I glanced at it. He seems very sure of himself, our Dr. Overton. Huh? Rather too sure of himself for an experienced pathologist. What do you know about him? Overton? Mm. I've never heard of him. Oh? Oh, Gravely usually does all the stiffs for the Home Office. Oh, Gravely. Yeah. What are our chances? Ah, as a sporting type, you want to know the odds, do you? Any better than evens? Well, it's not an easy case, but she's a woman. I think she may have been mistreated by her husband. Yeah. All we need is a sympathetic judge. Ah, well, we've drawn a board called Mr Justice Twyburn. What do you think? I think the odds have just lengthened considerably. Oh, well, what's, he, what's he like, then? Do you remember Martin Muschamp? Um, must No. Ah, no, he'd be a bit before your time. He went out with an armed gang. He was tried for killing a policeman. And a couple of years later, another lad confessed, and Muschamp was cleared by a home office inquiry. Oh, well, that's all right, then. Oh, yes, lovely for everyone, except Muschamp. Twyburn had summed up dead against him, and he'd been hanged by the neck. Oh, I don't look so worried. We don't do that sort of thing anymore. And the Crown must prove it. But at the end of the day, we feel you can be left in no possible doubt. That is all I have to say in opening this sad case, members of the jury. And now, with the assistance of my learned friend, Mr. Gavin Pinker, I hope to fairly put the evidence before you. You're causing me a great deal of pain, Mr. Harmsworth. I'm sorry, my lord. Please don't split them. 
Don't spit what, my lord? Your infinitives. This is a distressing case in all conscience. Do you have to add to the disagreeable nature of the proceedings the sound of you tormenting the English language? You hope to put the evidence fairly. Yes, my lord. Yes, why don't you start to do so? My learned friend, Mr. Pinker, will call the first witness. I'll call Mrs. Marion Hemp. Call oh, Mrs. Marion Hemp. Don't worry, old darling. <clears throat> He's quite impartial. It'll be just as beastly to me when my turn comes. Mrs. Hemp, how long have you worked for the Postons? Ten years now for Master Jonathan and his father before him. On the afternoon that Jonathan Poston died, did you hear anything going on between him and his wife? Yes. They were quarrelling. Could you hear any words? I heard two words. What were they? Kill you. I heard that said loud by her. Then I saw Mr. Poston go out. He walked towards the woods. What happened then? Mrs. Poston stayed indoors. Then she went out. How long did she stay out? Don't really know. Ten minutes, quarter of an hour, perhaps. Then she came back and got it. Got what? Her shotgun. Did you see her get the gun? No, but I saw her go out again with it under her arm. She went back towards the woods again. What happened next? Just tell the jury. I heard a shot from the wood. From the direction in which they had both gone? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Hemp. You heard one shot? No, I heard others. No, you heard others when? After Mr. Poston went out. Oh, yes, but after Mrs. Poston went out for the second time with her shotgun, how many shots did you hear then? Just one. You're quite sure of that? It was enough, wasn't it? Yes, perhaps. Now, these words you heard her say kill you. You have sworn that they're the only words you heard Mrs. Poston say. That's right. She couldn't have said, I'll kill you, for instance? No. Well, she might have been warning her husband that someone else might kill him, might she not? I suppose so. But she was the only one there, wasn't she? Exactly. Are you suggesting someone else might have shot him, Mr. Rumpel? Just exploring the possibilities, my lord. Mr. Figgis, when you first saw Mrs. Poston, what was she doing? Uh, well, she was holding a shotgun, standing about ten feet off it. Mm, eventually, you took the gun away from her and broke it open. I oh, did, yeah. How many cartridges had been fired? Oh, just one. Just one. And the spent cartridge was ejected? Yeah. And did you then go with her back to her house, where she telephoned the police? Oh, you did, yeah. And was her gun in your possession until the police arrived? Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Figgis. Mr. Figgis, when you first saw Mrs. Poston, what exactly did she say? She said, oh, I shot him. It was an accident. Oh? She said, I shot him. It was an accident. Well, might she not have said, um, I shot him? Uh, Mr. Rumpel, is there a dispute as to what the accused said? No, no dispute as to what was said, my lord, but I am very interested in discovering where the emphasis was put. As you may be interested in that, Mr. Rumpel. It remains to be seen in the fullness of time whether the point interests the jury. I think the point may be of considerable importance, my lord. The words are there. How they were said seems to be of unimportant insignificance. And might it not be better to say of insignificance, my lord? What? Uh, unimportant insignificance might be a bit of a tautology, might it not? Something of a torment to the English language. Ask your question, Mr. Rumpel. Don't mention it. Well, Mr. Figgis, what exactly did Mrs. Poston say? She said, I shot him, it was an accident. I shot him. Now, I wonder why she said it like that. There was no one else about at the time, was there, who might have shot him? Not as far as I can see. Not as far as you could see. Mr. Figgis, do you keep a calling pheasant? I don't know what you mean. I think you do. A cock pheasant in a cage whose cries attract the lady pheasants to your garden, where you conveniently dispatch them from a downstairs window. As far as I can see, you must have had pheasant for breakfast, dinner, and tea. Well, I, I might have done a bit of that, yes. Mr. Rumpel, this witness is not on trial for poaching. Has this evidence a slightest prevalence to the case? Uh, no doubt the jury will let us know that, my lord, in the fullness of time. Uh, what had you been doing that afternoon? I was in my cottage. And doing a bit of shooting, as usual. 
A little bit, yeah. And your garden is what? Some 10, 15 yards from the scene of the alleged crime? Mr. Rumpel, may I remind you that your client has already admitted shooting her husband with a shotgun. And shotgun wounds and pellets were found in her husband's body. Your Lordship may remind me of that, but I can assure your Lordship I had not forgotten it. Thank you, Mr. Figgis. Thank you, Mr. Figgis. No further questions. Very well. Members of the jury, this may be a convenient moment for you to take some refreshment. Be back at ten past two, please. Be upstanding. Are you coming down to see Sprawl? Uh, no, I don't think so, Fiona. Not until she decides to tell me what happened. A message from the learned judge. I'm under arrest. On the contrary, sir. You're invited to lunch in the lodgings. This case is full of surprises. The car's outside. We travel in roads, of course. Yes, of course. Lead me to the judicial roads. He sat beside me in the cinema, said the girl in the indecency case, and put his hand up my skirt. Very well, said the old recorder, with his eye on the clock at lunchtime. I suggest we leave it there till five past two. <laughs> well, no more argument about grammar this afternoon, eh, Rumpel? Ah, possibly not. So you stood up to me pretty well. That's what we need in our job, determination to stick to an argument. Even when it's a wrong one? Oh, mistakes can usually be put right. Oh, surely not always, my lord. Uh, you're thinking of the young fellow who went out on the robbery. Case where they shot a policeman. Martin Muschamp, yes. Muschamp. Yes, there was nothing else I could have done about that. Uh, he summed up the evidence. It was pretty damning, of course. And left the matter to the jury. All this argument about the death penalty. We managed to take it in our stride, did our duty. We didn't enjoy it, of course. A lot of rubbish talked about judges eating muffins after the death sentence. Well, you couldn't get muffins at the Army Navy Club. All you could do was sum up and leave the matter to the jury. Nothing else I could have done, was there? What's he want? I do believe he wants to be forgiven. Who on earth am I to forgive him? I don't know. If you'll excuse us, Judge, Mr. Pinker and I have some points to consider before the afternoon session. By all means. Thank you, my lord. Thank you for that. You a gardener, Rumpo? Uh, I'm afraid not. I'm a rose man myself. Of course, I've found it difficult to get round all the pruning since my wife died. He wants me to feel sorry for him. Come and look at this. Yes. That's the garden. The Mrs. Sam McCready's are flowering well, don't you think? Very nice. Those are two of my grandchildren. I've got six now altogether. That's the budding show jumper. Yes, I think I summed up my shrimp quite fairly. Didn't you tell the jury they might well not believe a single word of his evidence? Uh, that was my personal opinion, but they were quite free to come to their own conclusions, wouldn't you agree? What does he want from me? What crumb of comfort? So it is your view of the case, Inspector, is it not, that after the most thorough inquiry by the police, that Mrs. Poston fired one shot at her husband, and only one? That is absolutely clear, my lord. Absolutely clear. Thank you, Inspector. <laughs> Look, I'm Dr. Overton, <clears throat> the pathologist. I'm an extremely busy man. Might be kept hanging about all the afternoon. No, don't worry, Doctor. We've got the message. They're ready for you now. Uh, Dr. Overton, have you investigated previous cases of death by gunshot wounds? Uh, I think one. Only one? I see. And have you been called before to give evidence in a murder trial? No, not actually. 
Congratulations on your debut. Thank you. Uh, how was it exactly that you were called upon to conduct the post-mortem examination? Uh, is not the uh, Home Office pathologist for the Chester area uh, the highly experienced and very aptly named Dr. Gravely? Dr. Gravely was away at a conference at Scarborough. I was called in at short notice. Ah, and saw your big chance. His big chance of what, Mr. Rumpo? Perhaps your big chance of ingratiating yourself with the local police by agreeing with their conclusions. I did agree with their conclusions, yes. And with their view that the body of Jonathan Poston had received the impact of one and only one shotgun wound. That was my conclusion. Uh, from which we might infer uh, that it was the shot from Mrs. Poston's gun which caused his death, either deliberately or by accident. Yes. A shotgun wound consists, does it not, of a large central wound surrounded by an area of scattered shot. That's true. And the further away the shot is fired, the larger the area of scatter, and correspondingly smaller the central wound. I agree. I'm glad you do. Would you look at photograph number three, please? You have drawn a circle around the hole that you consider fatal. That is near the centre of the chest in the jury's photograph. I see that, yes. Mm. And that is where you consider the fatal shot entered. Well, I'm sure of it. Absolutely certain. <laughs> I have no doubts, whatever on the subject, Mr. Rumpel. How pleasant it must be to be so sure of yourself. Uh, there is another smaller wound just above it, is there not? Will you care to borrow my glass? No, I can see perfectly well, thank you. Is that the darkest spot on the photograph? Uh, just show us where you're looking, Doctor. Here, my lord. Yes. It's about two o'clock from the pencil circle, members of the jury. Yes, what did you take that to be? I took that to be um, part of the scatter. Could it not be the central wound from another shot fired from some distance further away? I suppose that's a possibility. Oh, indeed. It wasn't a minute ago, was it? Just a possibility. So when you told us that you were absolutely certain that there had been only one shot, you were giving this jury an opinion which was not entirely reliable. I see no reason to suppose there was more than one shot. Uh, but it is a possibility. Yes. And what would turn that possibility into a probability, Dr. Overton? Well, I suppose if there was some strong additional evidence. Of which you say there is none. Not as far as I know. That is something for the jury to consider, the extent of your knowing. How many pellets are there in the 20-gauge shotgun cartridge, Dr. Overton? I would say mm, about an ounce of shot. I didn't ask you how much it weighed. I asked you how many pellets there were. Um, uh, how, how many pellets? Are you hard of hearing, Dr. Overton? No, not in the least. Would you force yourself to answer my question? Yes, well, I, I think, I think I'd, 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 I'd have to look that one up. Look it up. You didn't think to look it up before you came here to give so-called expert evidence against a woman of unblemished character on a charge of murder? Then let us see if you remember this without having to look it up. When you conducted the post-mortem examination, you found a large number of shot in the deceased's body. A very large number indeed. A very large number. I am obliged to you. Did you count them? But may I look at my notes? Oh, look at whatever you like, except the inspector in charge of the case. He's not able to help you now. Mr. Rumpel. Oh, your lordship objected to that observation. I'll withdraw it. Well, how many pellets were found in the deceased body, Doctor? 478, my lord. And there may have been some you missed. Some that missed their target altogether. Uh, there may well have been. For your information, Doctor, and to save you the trouble of looking it up, the average contents of a 20-gauge shotgun cartridge is between 250 and 270 pellets. Well, I must accept that, of course. So does not the presence of almost double the number of pellets in the deceased body suggest to you that there must have been a second shot? <clears throat> it might do so. Might it not? And if Mrs. Poston fired only one shot, as three independent witnesses have testified, might not a second person have fired the other? Uh, surely that is a conclusion for the jury, Mr. Rumpel. It is a submission of mine, my lord, that I consider that to be the only conclusion. Thank you, Dr. Overton. Oh, Doctor, before you go. Yes. If you intend to continue in your present line of work, may I recommend Professor Ackerman's Gunshot Wounds in Forensic Medicine? It's a handy little volume. Well, quite an easy read for the beginner. And no further questions, my lord. Very well. I think we'll break off there. At 10.30 tomorrow morning, members of the jury. You have standing. 
Are you having anything to do with the Queen's justices for the city of Tester made depart hence and give your attendance here tomorrow morning at 10.30 of the clock in the forenoon? God save the Queen and my lords, the Queen's justices. Run home. Ah, oh, Fiona. Your cross-examination of that unfortunate pathologist may have been first-class entertainment. Yes, indeed. I haven't enjoyed myself so much since I got old Ackerman himself to change his mind about a bloodstain. Where does it get my sister? Mm. Oh, just possibly off. Sprod says it was an accident. Mm. Are you suggesting there were two accidents? No, only one accident. What are you getting at? Your sister is not too keen on the truth coming out in this case, is she? Why don't you come down and ask her? Uh, no, not tonight, Fiona. Tonight I am dining at the Tester Arms. I'm expecting company. Mr. Rumpo. Mr. Fishbourne, sit down, why don't you? Did you have a good dinner? I had what is called the Tester Arms set meal. Pate maison in the form of liver ice cream. A steak cut from the nether end of some elderly animal and lightly singed under an x-ray machine. And a cheese board aptly named. The cheddar had the flavor and consistency of damp sawdust. Oh, and the whole sumptuous repast topped off with a bottle of ice cold claret, which made Pomeroy's plonk taste like Chateau Lafitte. What have you got to tell me, Mr. Fishbourne? You can't get her off, can you? You tell me. I mean, I don't see how you can. She said she did it. Did she tell you that? No. She won't see me. Oh, indeed. But you know why John O'Poston would have wanted to see you, though, don't you? It wouldn't have been to criticize your riding ability, would it? No, it wasn't for that. What she actually said was, I shot him. It was an accident. Who else did she think might have shot him, do you suppose? Who else do you think could have shot him, Mr. Fishbourne? It couldn't possibly have been me. Oh, indeed. Why not? I wasn't here. I'd gone up to London, quite unexpectedly. I had a call from our lawyers, and I went up just after lunch. Any number of people saw me. Our first bit of luck in this case. That is a splendid example of what we call in the trade a cast-iron alibi. He couldn't have done it. He was in London with his lawyers, so you can stop shielding him. Yes, I remembered seeing your face when he fell at the last fence. You were very upset. I thought you were his wife. But then afterwards, you were laughing at him with the others, so I knew you were hiding something. John O found out, did he? Such a mess. <laughs> what shall I do? Why not try telling the truth? Sometimes people win cases doing that. Look, they can't keep... Oh, sorry. Look, they, they can't keep the judge waiting any longer. Well, what do you say? Shall we give it a try? The truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Mrs. Poston, on the afternoon that your husband died, you quarrelled. What was the quarrel about? About Maurice Fishbourne. He is your next door neighbour? Yes. yes. What did you tell your husband? I told Jonathan that I loved Maurice and that if he would divorce me, we hoped to marry. I had been unhappy with my husband for a long time. Had he been violent? Yes. Quite often. So that on the afternoon that you quarrelled? He said he'd go over and see Morris and tell him never to see me again. He threatened to beat Morris up. I knew that Morris could have a violent temper and that he hated my husband. I, I think I said if he went, that Morris might kill him. Ah, Morris might kill him. Had Morris told you that he might kill your husband? When he heard how he treated me, yes. Yeah. And you had taken those threats seriously. I knew that Morris was a very determined man, that 
He has a strong will. Yes. Let us come to the moment when your husband left the house. He said he'd gone out to cool off. After a while, I thought he'd gone to Morris's, so I decided to follow him. I got as far as the track by Figgis's cottage, and I saw Jonathan. Well, the... Yes, go on. Well, there was blood. I, I saw that he was dead. Yeah. I thought that Morris had done it. It was just by his wood. And? I knew that Morris couldn't get away with it, and that he'd be convicted of murdering Jonathan. I did not know at that time that he was up in London. I, I suppose I, I was in a sort of panic. Yes. So what did you decide to do? I decided to pretend that I'd shot Jonathan by mistake in an accident. I went back to the house and got my shotgun. And when I got back to the wood, I put in one cartridge and I fired. One shot only? Yes, only one. Into your husband's dead body? Yes. Now, listen, Rumpo, as you are in Tester, surely you could spare a few minutes and go and have a look at the place? Hilda, I simply haven't got the time. Well, you must make time. Is that much to ask? Uh, members of the jury, uh, contrary to the views of some people, a British criminal trial cannot be compared in any way to a horse race. You do not get at the result by closing your eyes and sticking a pin into a list of runners. If you believe that for whatever reason, Mrs. Poston deliberately shot at her husband with the intention of killing him or doing him serious injury, then you must convict her. But if you think that the account she gave you might be true, I say might be true, then she's entitled to be acquitted. There is some support for Mrs. Poston's story, is there not, in the medical evidence. I do wonder, have we got Martin Muschamp to thank for the unexpected fairness of the summing up? Uh, so that you have to consider the possibility that Mr. Poston met his death on that woodland track by an accident caused by the man Figgis shooting from his cottage window, and that Mrs. Poston, coming on the body, assumed her lover had been responsible and took extraordinary steps to cover up what she thought had been a crime. Now, this is not a court of morals, members of the jury. Neither is it a race course. What we are concerned with is certainty and the truth. And once again, the pound has fallen in the European markets. At Tester Crown Court, the jury have returned a verdict of not guilty on Mrs. Jennifer Poston was charged with the murder of her husband, the Honourable Jonathan Poston. Well, Rumpel, I suppose you think you've done something frightfully clever. No, Hilda, I think I've done something absolutely brill. I don't suppose you were brill enough to go and look at that delightful property. Jennifer Poston, remarkable woman. She went to the most extraordinary lengths to shield the man she loved. Fiona's sister? Yes. Not very much like Fiona, though, is she? Rather more beautiful, wouldn't you say? Much more like that other gorgeous creature down there, Agatha. Oh, we'll be seeing quite a lot of them when we fix up about this gentleman's lodge arrangement you're always talking about. They promised to give me shooting lessons. Shooting lessons? You mm. run home. Yeah, there'll be lots of time. Oh, I suppose you'll be kept busy bottling fruit and drying herbs and all that sort of thing. Bottling fruit? Yeah, and drying herbs. Herbs. You know, Rumpo, mm. I've been thinking, this flat in the Gloucester Road is very convenient for us, isn't it? Oh, yes, but... We uh, can always have days out in the country, can't we? Well, I suppose that's true, but... No, but, but... no, no, no. Oh, but didn't your daddy always say... No, Rumpo. For your sake, I think I've decided against Tester. Oh, well, Hilda, it's your decision. S-W-M-B-O. <laughs> Thank you.
This episode is called Rumpole and the Sporting Life. Barristers used to have days out with a, a race which barristers would ride or their ho- they would own the horses that ride. And uh, Hilda takes Rumpole out. Rumpole doesn't really enjoy country life, but there's a scene in this episode in a car where he's sitting and a very large dog sitting behind him keeps on licking his face. And in order to play this scene, the wonderful Leo McKern allowed us to put butter behind his ears so that the dog would uh, be licking him. The case which arises out of this uh, day in the country is that uh, uh, one of the, the wife of one of the winning jockeys, who is also a horse owner and an upper-class person, confesses to having shot him and is tried for murder. And by perhaps a fortunate chance, the judge, Rumpo discovers, is someone who hanged a person convicted of murder who was afterwards found to be innocent. And he has an uneasy conscience about this and uh, does his very best for the defence. Congratulations. What do you have on it? A quid each way? I'll be able to retire to Bermuda. First, number 13, Atlantic Hero, ridden by the Honourable Jonathan Poston. Second, number 8, Cash Point. And third, number 4. Oh, I'm so oh, sorry five. that Philadelphia wasn't able to be with us today. Yeah, uh, Philly's got this long fraud up in Leeds. <laughs> yes. She's working all the weekend. Uh, she would so much have enjoyed it. Of course, Rampo has really no sporting interest. I've often wondered why sporting interests have to be held in leaking wellies and cold mud. What do you fancy for this here clock, Henry? Well, his clerk tells me that Mr Lorimer's not all that fit. He's been overworking on his revenue cases. Likely to fall at the first fence, is he? Hmm. Harley Waters, QC. In good condition, is he? Been taking his oats and all that? Yeah, rather too liberally, according to his clerk. No, the fancy is Mr E. Smith on decree absolute. Oh, uh, in good form, is he? Tea total, his clerk informs me. And he does press ups in chambers. Simply, Uncle Tom, I won. Oh, really, Mrs. Rumpel? I didn't know you were running. <laughs> Will the course doctor please come to the declarations office? The course doctor, please. I'm so glad. This one is on me, you know. Oh, uh, Hilda's in the chair. Let's come round. God. Oh, there you are, Rumpel. I haven't had you before me lately. I suppose you don't get any of the serious crimes these days. Oh, I've been occupied elsewhere. I must join my wife. She's spending the winnings. I've been having a little fluffy here, have you? I don't see you as a gambling man, exactly. I suppose a lifetime spent in old Bailey trials gives one a taste for games of chance. What's that supposed to mean? Well, don't you sometimes feel that trying to assess the outcome of the case is rather like sticking a pin in the sporting light with your eyes shut? The aim of an English criminal trial is to do justice. I don't see you can possibly compare it to a horse race. 
Good day, Askin Brown. Good day to you, sir. Propos. Clyburn's our oldest judge. Yes, I know, I know. They appointed so long ago they can't get rid of him. He's one of the last survivors that ever sentenced people to death. They say he used to order muffins at his club on those occasions. <laughs> Come on, sweetheart, fill this cherry up with shampoo. Oh, lovely cup. John is excessively real, isn't he? One small rum, Hilda. Is that the extent of our celebration? I thought you were going to fill my wellies with champers. Well, cheers. You're very good, Hilda. Thank you, Rob. Oh, Mrs. Rumpel. How are you, Erskine Brown? Oh, all right, I suppose, Fiona. You're in uniform, too. All oh, these khaki-clad figures slogging through the mud. Reminds me of the retreat from Mons. <laughs> <laughs> you were never at Mons. Rumpel was in the RAF ground staff, but you're all right. Put me in mind of the nap in the RAF Uxbridge after every night. <laughs> well, this is for another fifth race. Hello, Mrs. Oh, hi, Spock. Disgusting to see you. Loathsome to see you. You two obviously know each other. This is my big sister, Jennifer Poston. This is Rumpo, Mrs. Rumpo. Oh, how riveting. I've heard so much about you. Pimsy says you got her into chambers by some miracle. <laughs> It was one of my trickier cases, yes. Pimsy says you win them all because you're the most super barrister in the whole of England. Absolutely brilliant, says Pimsy. Daddy always came to the bar races, but it took me weeks to persuade Rumpel to accept Claude Erskine Brown's wonderful invitation. <laughs> Did you come on your own, Fiona? No, with my boyfriend, Jeremy Jarling. He's rather dull, but he is a solicitor. He's the one doing the serious drinking. <laughs> oh, look. There's my gorgeous wither. I say, your wife, is she really the one you call she? No, she's call. the one I call Hilda. Rumpo, that's the chap who won for me on Atlantic Hero. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Kiss for the winner, John. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, well done. Oh, yeah. Such a nice looking young man. Do you know him? He's my husband. Oh, really? I do think I ought to thank him personally. Well, come on, then. Why don't we whiz over? Oh. Oh, I, I say, I must just say, well done. It does make a day at the races so much more thrilling when you're on a winner. Where are you? I can't say I saw you. <laughs> Oh, these amazing old weeklies. <laughs> this is Mr. and Mrs. Rumpel, John. I'm Claude Erskine Brown. Mr. Rumpel's a tremendous legal eagle. Oh, my God, you're not one of the galloping barristers. Oh, hardly. None of your lot got placed. Terribly bad luck. Go for a swig. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Well Thank done. you very well much. Fish face. <laughs> He's cutting us dead. Come on, fish, don't be weedy. Good afternoon, Miss Fish. This is Maurice Fishbourne, who lives next door to Jennifer and John. Oh. Delighted to meet you. I say, Fish, how did you manage to stick on to the last fence? Super glue. <laughs> <laughs> he was hanging on to the main, I saw oh, him. Congratulations, Jonathan. Oh, isn't he a lovely loser? I say, Fish, if you want to ride something in the next place, why not try a bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not riding in the next race. Oh, is Mummy taking you home to tea? I'm driving mother home, yes, Jennifer. Oh, come on, Fishy. Have a gulp of shampoos. It's quite all right. Only got all our germs in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Lodge for sale on Gentleman's Estate in Woodhead Country, near Chester. Mm. What's that you're reading, Hilda? Country life, of course. But were there no daily telegraphs? Three bedrooms, two recepts, with access to good rough shooting. Oh, I rather think... Doesn't it sound attractive, Rumpo? I rather think I've got worries enough without you taking up rough shooting. What did you say? I said it might be safer in tooting or around the inner London sessions. I mean, in those places, one can go for a walk without running the risk of getting a charge of grape shot or whatever it is in your britches. Nonsense, Rumpo. That day at the bar races made me realise what we're missing. Mud? The countryside. Oh. Now, then, if we sold our lease here... Oh, yes, we could... we could buy a deer park in a Palladian mansion. Daddy always used to say that what a successful barrister really needed was a place in the country. 
Was he speaking from the stately semi-detached to 13 Acacia Avenue, Horsham at the time? Can't you just see us from here? Sitting by a log fire, taking a glass of sherry, perhaps, while the sun sinks over the home wood. Hilda, I can see us with the boiler gone out and all the London trains cancelled, up to our elbows in snow and mud. And out in the home wood, somebody's bound to be killing something. I shot him. It was an accident. No, I really would rather not, Fiona, but I'll put your sister onto a good man. Rob Hulsprod wants you to defend her. Well, that's probably because you've given your sister a quite exaggerated idea of my abilities. Is it really possible to exaggerate your abilities? No, probably not. Well, why shouldn't my sister have the best possible counsel available? No, friends, Fiona. What? It's a rule at the bar, never appear for friends. You care too much, your judgment gets warped, you can't see the weaknesses in your own case. And, of course, if you lose, they never, ever forgive you. But my sister's not your friend, you only met her the once. Quite honestly, you hardly know her. I know you, though. All the trouble I had getting you into these chambers by some pretty ruthless manoeuvring, if you want to know the truth. And then I have to spend the rest of my life avoiding your eye in the clerk's room, too afraid to pop into Pomeroy's for a strengthener in case you're there, looking at me more in sorrow than in anger, because I lost your sister's case. No, thank you. Life would be quite intolerable. I do understand that, but... But me no buts, Fiona. I was only going to say, but... You aren't going to lose it, are you? Oh... <sighs> Rumble. Uh, yes. Just a minute. Ah, why don't you find your stuff in here, eh? Ah, thank you. Nice to meet you. Darling, Jeremy, darling. Yes, how do you do? Something in the Boston case. Yes. Sorry again. Now, please hop in. Uh, no. Oh, don't mind Agatha. She's a soppy old date, really. <laughs> There's a young girl. Now then, where would you like to go? Ah, test her arms or the prison? Well, let's uh, which is the least uncomfortable? I would say the prison, a pinch. Oh? Run you there, shall I? It's a little way out of town. Thank you. Built up. Pardon? Uh, oh, yes. Well, I must say, this is all the GMBU. GMBU? Grand Willis, it falls up. Well, you ah. have since we had a murder in the test a hunt, you know. Yeah. Well, Agatha, do sit down. Stop kissing Mr. Rumpel. Oh, she's fine. Yeah. Well, it'll get all those damn blood sports protesters going, you know. Yeah. You're a partner, are you? Yeah, darling, Agatha, leave Mr. Rumpel alone with No, no, Just no, she's down. fine, she's fine. Is it, um, Charlie and Leonard, actually? Yeah. It's my father's firm, if I've ah. But he uh, doesn't like murder cases, so he's handed this one on to me. Do, Agatha, will you sit down? Stop kissing Mr. Rumpole. Oh, she's fine. <laughs> uh, well, you know what they say. They have to start at the bottom. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Did you, uh, did you know Jonathan Poston well? No, only very briefly, I'm afraid. Uh, you know, people around here had a tremendous lot of time, do I? Oh, really, I'm sorry. Huh? Well, it's the last thing a defence needs in a murder case, a well-liked corpse. Oh. Well, of course, you'd uh, 
you'd know all about that, wouldn't you? And if anyone trouble with John O'Poston, bad case of the MTFs. The uh... MTFs must touch flesh. 